cookbooks today that I got from our library. Uh, the first one is Zen Women, which is by Grace Shearson Roshi, who is a uh, very strong feminist. And so this book is written from a very feminist perspective. And she was instrumental in um, bringing forward a uh, Keichimiyaku uh, or lineage paper of the women's lineage that uh, some teachers give out, not all teachers give that out, not all Sanghas chant the women's lineage as we do. Um, so trying to decide where to start here. Uh, then the other book that I got out of the library, and you can ask Mickey, I'm sure there are more books in the library about the our women ancestors. This one is Eminent Nuns, Women Chan Masters of 17th Century China. And this is by Beata Grant. So these are uh, important books if you want to study the women's lineage because the women have been mostly left out of the lineages for many centuries. Um, and the current crop of women Zen teachers have striven to remedy that situation. So we can talk about our own Edo Roshi um, a lot of people don't know that this uh, Sangha was, is classified as a convent and that when Edo Roshi first came to Olympia, she had the intention of starting a women's um, monastery. Uh, she didn't call it a monastery, but she wanted to have a place for women to live and practice together. So that was her original intention. And that is why legally, this building is classified as a convent. So um, we've had both male and female residents uh, in this building, but uh, mostly it's been women. Uh, what else? Well, and Ada Roshi also, during her time here as teacher, was always careful to uphold women in practice. Uh, she, the whole purpose of Temple Ground, which I have spoken about before, whole purpose of Temple Ground Press was to bring to uh, acknowledgement the teachings of women Zen teachers, which were not being published by the traditional Buddhist publishers. They were being ignored by the traditional Buddhist publishers. And so Edo Roshi made it her business to bring these the teachings of Zen women priests to the attention of the public through Temple Ground Press. And she was successful. Uh, the publishers have now begun to publish some books by women and priests, which they were not doing before. So in that, we must deeply bow to Edo Roshi for making that happen. Uh, so, Mahapajapati. Mahapajapati is considered to be the mother of women's Buddhist practice because she was very persistent in her um, petitioning of the Buddha to allow women to be admitted to the Sangha. So Mahapajapati was the Buddha's aunt. She was, her sister is, uh, Maya is the one who gave birth to the Buddha, um, and she was also, after his mother died, his stepmother. His mother died shortly after the Buddha's birth, and Mahapajapati 
uh, nursed the Buddha along with her own son. So she gave him life, basically. Uh, and it was a time, of course, the culture did not, uh, in the cult Indian culture of that time, uh, women were uh, cloistered um, and they didn't have any particular rights to speak to anyone. So um, after Mahapajapati, and her name means uh, leader of the assembly, great leader of the assembly, um, she, uh, once she was widowed, then her responsibilities as a wife and a mother were ended pretty much. Widows in India were non-people um, unless they remarried. So uh, her, her responsibilities at home had ended and she um, went to, the, she started to um, work with the local women who were also widowed or orphaned or might be prostitutes who had retired from their business um, or people or wives who had been abandoned because the Buddha's practice put great emphasis on leaving home <coughs> and giving up family and responsibilities and practicing only in the Dharma. And this left quite a lot of women at home without a husband, uh, which we don't speak of too much, but that's what happened. So these abandoned women uh, were taken up by Mahapajapati. From her privileged position, she began to help these women. And finally, she went to uh, the Buddha and she said to him, um, you know, it's time that you allowed women to become uh, ordained members of the Sangha. Women can be homely, verse 2. Now, this was kind of a radical concept in those days because uh, women weren't allowed to abandon their responsibilities and just run off and practice the Dharma. That wasn't something that uh, was culturally acceptable. Um, but she went to the Buddha and she said, um, it's time for you to allow women to come into the Sangha and be ordained, and we would like to have an order of our own. And she went to the Buddha three times and asked him this, and three times he told her, don't set your heart on this Mahapajapati. So she was very upset by this. And after the Buddha went to, to his uh, summer monastery, she gathered her women followers and she cut off her hair and she put on a saffron robe like all the monks were wearing and um, took her women and they started on this journey to petition the Buddha once more. Now, you're not supposed to ask anymore after you've been refused three times, uh, but she was persistent. So uh, she took her women and they walked about 150 miles barefoot and covered with dust. They arrived with bloody feet and they were standing outside the Buddha's door when Ananda came by and saw them. And he said, why are you weeping? because they were weeping. And, and they told him, we've asked the Buddha three times to give us, to allow us to have our own order, to be ordained in the Dharma so that we can practice and receive enlightenment. And uh, Ananda thought, well, he, he'd go and intercede with Buddha. So the Buddha, or the, Ananda asked the Buddha three times, you know, uh, these women have walked so far and they're standing outside with bloody feet and they're covered with dust. And this is your stepmother who suckled you at her breast as a baby and has taken care of you and, and taken care of your family. Uh, and how can you refuse her? 
And the Buddha replied the same way to Ananda that he had replied to Mahapajapati. Ananda, don't set your heart on this. So Ananda thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try a different tack. Uh, so then he said, well, is it possible for women to become enlightened? And, and the Buddha said, eventually, yes. <laughs> and so then Ananda said, well, if women can become enlightened, then they should be ordained. And so the Buddha actually bought that argument. And he said, okay, women can be ordained, but have to meet these eight conditions. Now, these eight conditions were rather onerous, uh, and I'll just mention two of them. Uh, one of them was that uh, the, the, a monk who had practiced for a hundred years would have to allow precedence to a, a nun, I'm sorry, a nun who had practiced for a hundred years would have to give precedence to a monk who had only been a monk for one day. So in that particular respect, it meant that monks always had precedence over the nuns. And the last one was that monks could admonish or correct uh, nuns, but nuns could not admonish or correct monks. No matter how wise they were, no matter how full of the Dharma or enlightenment, they could not correct or admonish the monks. So the women said, okay, we'll accept those conditions and they formed a sangha and they were ordained and became nuns so this was how the female side of the sangha came into being was because of mahapajapati's persistence in pursuing the ordination of women and, and in the in the um echo this morning, we, uh, we talked about how Maha Pajapati made the Sangha whole. And that's how she made the Sangha whole, because the Sangha was one sided if it was just for one gender. Uh, it, it was it was it needed to be balanced by the other side of of our population. So men and women needed to be able to practice the dharma together now they didn't ever in those days and for a long time afterwards actually practice together this is a, a consequence of the dharma coming to the west where equality is one of the um it's one of the uh, ideals that we pursue. And so in the West, it wasn't acceptable for practice to be separated by male practice and female practice. Um, there are probably places where that still occurs, but even in cloistered monasteries such as Shasta Abbey, the men and the women still practice together. Uh, so um, that's been a development uh, of Western practice. So we give gratitude to Maha Prajapati and we honor her every year at this time on Mother's Day because mothers are the people that are persistent and mothers are the people that are responsible for most of the details of daily life even though these many centuries later things are changing in that regard slowly i think but still women mostly bear the burden of the household and, and uh, some of them do it very joyously and very wondrously. And we honor those people in their spirit of practice 
uh, that they are, are um, producing and nurturing. The nurturing um, aspect of motherhood is so important. And to nurture human beings and provide them with a place of safety and comfort uh, is one of the highest practices that one can do. We all aspire to that in our interactions in the Sangha. We aspire to be motherly in the mind that we have toward each other. We aspire to nurture each other. We aspire to care for each other. We aspire to provide safety for each other to express and become whatever we, our innermost being needs to become. So we follow in the steps of Mahapajapati in doing that, in making sure that nobody is left out of practice, that everyone is welcomed into the Sangha, that no one is left out. And in that we are very persistent, I hope. 